Since the earliest time, man has imagined this moment, the moment when his fellow man would make the first journey to the moon. There was about a third chance that they'd make it, a third that they'd have to call it off, and then a third that it just wouldn't come back at all. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. So much could have gone wrong. Astronauts Armstrong and Aldrin, now in the lunar module, separate from the command module. Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. Armstrong was now completely on his own. Even NASA, they didn't really know what was going on now. 30 seconds. Forward. They just had to try and land. On back right? OK. We copy it down, Eagle. Yeah, I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. The iconic photo of Buzz Aldrin on the surface of the moon captures everything, I think, in one shot. Dear God, here's a photograph of a man standing on the moon. Every front page in the world. It's such a simple image, and what it represents is nothing but simple. I mean, what it represents is humankind's greatest achievement to date. You'd do it all again? Yeah, I'm sure the, there'd be trying moments if I did it again. But having gone through it once, I'd be a much smarter person. And yet, Buzz, it almost destroyed you. Right. As a young boy, when I looked up at the stars, of course, yes, I wanted to go travel, to explore, to find out more. As many, you know, boys and girls do, it's that kind of uh, passion for exploration, for adventure, and for furthering our knowledge and understanding. I do remember feeling extremely excited to be able to go out and look at the moon and then find out that humans had stood on the surface of the moon. Take your seats for the moon. Tickets a little over £48 million each. 145 million pounds, that's the cost of Apollo 11. The Apollo programme is really a multifaceted programme. And really, at its heart, it is a programme that was driven by politics. America wanted to have some of the success that the Soviets had previously had. One day, the head of NASA got a phone call from Kennedy's people and just said, uh, there's, there's going to be this speech at Rice University, which um, JFK is going to give. You might want to watch it. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The head of NASA in Houston woke up that night screaming. They had no idea how to do it. So that was where it started from, this impossible task given to them by this president who really didn't know how difficult it was going to be. The general feeling was there was about a third chance that they'd make it and it'd be successful, a third that they'd have to call it off, and then a third that it just wouldn't come back at all. Do you harbor any fear, or, would, or how would you describe your attitude just before flight. Any one of you, or all. I wouldn't uh, say, uh, Walter, that fear is an unknown emotion to us. Fear is uh, characteristic uh, particularly of the knowledge that there may be something that you haven't thought of and feel that you uh, would might be unable to cope with. NASA chose those with the right stuff, but as the Apollo program progressed, only the complete all-round astronaut would make the grade. They were pretty much all taken as test pilots, most with a, a fast jet background. They were looking for people who were able to work in a very technical environment, dealing with problems, finding solutions. Michael Collins said that he never felt that the crew gelled. Armstrong, he liked very much, as they all did, but he was quite remote. Aldrin is just quite a quirky, eccentric character. The tradition was that the commander stayed with the ship, so it should have been Aldrin coming out first. But someone, somewhere, made the decision that it was going to be Armstrong. The Saturn V rocket is just an incredible feat of engineering. It's a beast. It's an absolute monster of a rocket. 
to actually put everything on one rocket and send it up into Earth orbit and then off to the moon. It's an incredibly bold endeavor. T minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. It just felt like the whole world just sort of stopped. I, there was, I remember there was no one on the streets. Everyone was in watching on TV. 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence starts. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Lots of people burst into tears with the ground shaking and the idea that there were human beings in this being blasted into space. One of the great moments of, of scientific history. During the three-day journey to the moon, the astronauts kept busy. Checklists, navigation and observation, housekeeping. They must work in a weightless environment, keeping their spacecraft and themselves in good condition. Experiments must be performed, including photography both inside and outside the spacecraft. About halfway, they turn around, so they're suddenly looking at the moon, which is big now. Most of them will say that's the first point at which they thought, oh, wow, we really are going to the moon. July 19th, Apollo 11 slows down and goes into orbit around the moon. Astronauts Armstrong and Aldrin, now in the lunar module, separate from the command module. Leaving Michael Collins in orbit as the sole witness of man's most daring endeavor of attempting to land on the moon. They began their descent, which was going to take about 10 minutes. The lunar module will be called the Eagle. Roger, Eagle, Sun God. Roger, how does it look? The Eagle has wings. Roger. Now it was at this point that all the drama started. You're a go to continue power descent. Suddenly the, the, this program, what was called a program alarm, happened with this piercing buzzer. Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. And what they realized was that the lunar module computer was being overloaded. And what this meant was that the radar would have been unreliable. And so they carried on down, and NASA had to confirm among themselves. They decided that actually it was OK. It wasn't, it wasn't catastrophic, and they could carry on down. Roger, we got you. We're going at alarm. The problem is that in dealing with the alarms, they realized as they got near the surface that they were going to overshoot the, the inviting plane on which they were going to land. Houston, you're a go for landing, over. So Armstrong was now completely on his own. Even NASA, they didn't really know what was going on now. Time alarm. Altitude 1600. 100 feet, down at 19. He found another place that looked, you know, better, and then he came down and got closer. There was a crater there. So he had to kind of drift across it. 1201, roger, 1201 alarm. Where go? Fix forward. And all the while, fuel was coming down. So he was getting these these um, these messages from Earth. Sixty seconds. Sixty seconds worth of fuel. Lights on. Down two and a half. Forward. Forward. Good. Forty feet down two and a half. Picking up some dust. As they were coming down and getting nearer the exhaust from the lunar module sent this huge uh, showers of dust up all around and he couldn't see where he was going. 30 seconds. Forward. And so they just had to try and land. Contact light. OK, we copy you down, Eagle. The odds of them crashing would have been much higher than the odds of actually landing safely which he did. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Through the window of the Eagle, Armstrong and Aldrin see what no human eyes have ever seen before. Their spacecraft casts a long shadow across the undisturbed dust of centuries. 
Seven hours after landing, after careful preparations for later ascent were completed, Armstrong opens the Eagle hatch and begins his climb down to the surface. And we're getting a picture on the TV. Some 600 million people, about a fifth of the world's population, shared the televigil. Long through the night, when well into the morning, we waited for the ultimate reward for Neil Armstrong to gain that first historic foothold on a new world. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. The surface appears to be very fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Yeah, I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Neil Armstrong taking those first steps on the moon, the grainy black and white video of him coming down the steps of the lunar module and landing for the first time. Very fuzzy, hard to see any details. The iconic photo of Buzz Aldrin on the surface of the moon captures everything, I think, in one shot. You can see every single detail. One of the things I really love is that it's actually completely accidental. So the camera that was carried by um, Neil Armstrong didn't have a viewfinder, it was t attached to his chest. And so when he was wanting to take a photo of Buzz Aldrin and Buzz is sort of, you know, awkwardly moving across the surface, that snap is taken. It's the most extraordinary photograph. Dear God, here's a photograph of a man standing on the moon. Buzz is stood there on the surface of the moon, this very grey, barren and featureless terrain there that we're, we're not used to seeing, a very inhospitable environment. In the visor, you see Neil Armstrong. You also see the lunar module. You see the flag in the background. The shadow that's cast as well, sort of coming out of the bottom left of the photo, all adds to the way your eye is guided in to look at this human being who's made it onto the moon. It's such a simple image, but beautiful, and what it represents is nothing but simple. I mean, what it represents is humankind's greatest achievement to date. Contact light. OK, we copy you down, Eagle. After humankind's most epic journey, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin had landed on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And they brought a special message with them to commemorate the moment. We'll read the plaque that's on the front landing gear of this lamb. Here, men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 1969. It is. It came in peace for all mankind. The environment of space is very different to being here on Earth in terms of the lighting conditions, for example, where on Earth we see the sun as a nice yellow sun and we see a blue sky. In space, it's black and white, literally. The sun isn't going through any atmosphere, and so it's not yellow. It's a pure white light, you know, burning brightly from a nuclear furnace. And that stark white light contrasts against the pure black of space. And in the daytime, there are no stars in space. You don't see any stars because the, the reflection of the Earth's light and the Moon's light block out any stars. So you have this contrast between pure black and white. One of the reasons why, unfortunately, there's, there is a conspiracy theory about not landing on the Moon is because of how photographs from space look. They really paint a really alien scene. This is nothing that we would ever have experienced or be able to experience on the Earth. It's almost like a studio, because in a studio, you know, often you want a clean, pure, single light source, and you want to get that lighting effect. Well, in space, you have that. It's just the sun. It makes the photographs look like studio settings. And that combined with the weightless environment, which is very unreal. I mean, people who haven't experienced weightlessness have no idea how everyday objects react in weightlessness. And when you actually see water growing into a bubble, if you let water out of your pouch. Yes, indeed. They've got the flag up now. 
So of course, if you have a flag in weightlessness, it's going to look and act very differently. Now to an astronaut, we're very familiar with that, but if you haven't experienced that yourself, it looks very unnatural, it looks very unreal. And you know, a conclusion for some people to jump to is it looks so unreal, therefore it must be fake. The Apollo 11 photographs are everything really, aren't they? Because they tell that story and they tell it from a very human perspective, recording all of the details, the footprints on the moon, how the dust looked. In a way, those photographs put you on the moon and allow you to share that experience in a really visceral way. Now on the Apollo 11 mission, as it was the, the first lunar landing, there was only one of these special surface cameras. But that was attached to Neil Armstrong's spacesuit. All they had to do was press the shutter very simply, which then took an exposure. In terms of framing, literally it was lean back, lean forward, and then turn to get the area they wanted. Using spacesuits, there's no way that they can actually view anything through the camera, so the viewfinder has been removed along with all the additional weight of mirrors and shutters. They had a very special lens, the Zeiss Biogon 60mm. Now that lens was specifically designed for lunar surface missions. From Apollo 11 onwards, to save weight on the return and allow more moon rock to be collected, the camera bodies and lenses were left on the surface. Only the film bags were returned to Earth. So that means there are currently 13 Hasselblads left on the moon waiting to come home. Very quiet ride. There's that one crater on there. Oh, beautiful. Very smooth. Very quiet ride. After Armstrong and Aldrin rendezvoused with Michael Collins in the mothership, they set course for Earth and a hero's welcome. Apollo blazes across the heavens, coming back to Earth at 25,000 miles an hour. President Richard Nixon was waiting aboard the recovery carrier to welcome the returning voyagers. The spirit of Apollo transcends geographical barriers and political differences. It can bring the people of the world together in peace. People remember the Apollo program with a sense of nostalgia and of pride and of excitement and of ambition and achievement. All of these wonderful things wrapped up together. The moon men were received by the royal family. As the astronauts toured the world, the pressure of being the most known men on the planet started to take its toll. Michael Collins later said that um, he thought Buzz actually was more tormented by not being first than he was, you know, pleased and delighted at being second. Can you remember if you were disappointed when the decision was taken, what, a month or so before you actually went to the moon? Oh, yeah, certainly disappointed. But I think that uh, my life would have been a little more hectic had I been the first. Who knows, I might even even decided to become a college professor the way Neil did. Armstrong, who had to deal with this enormous celebrity, actually went back and taught for a while. He became a professor of engineering and later sort of withdrew from public as the pressure got really intense. Aldrin came back and, and struggled with uh, alcoholism and depression and was seemed sort of dissatisfied. That photo, as well as being, you know, the thing of beauty it is and the, seeming to capture the whole enterprise in itself, also speaks in a, in a really fascinating way to the relationship and the two people that these were. The best way to honor and remember all those who were part of the Apollo program is to follow in our footsteps, to boldly go again 
on a great new mission of exploration. Being told that you've been selected as an astronaut, it's, it's an incredible mixture of emotions. And there we can see Tim Peake from the European Space Agency, the first British astronaut now on board the International Space Station. Of course, euphoria. I mean, it's something you've worked so hard for and you've dreamed about for many, many years. Tim, it's really cool seeing that Union Jack go outside. This is explored all over the world. Now it's explored space. It's great to be wearing it. Privilege. When you see the planet from space, it gives you this overall view of our planet, which does change your impression of how fragile we are, what a tiny, tiny, insignificant speck in, in the universe we are. Now we're looking at reigniting the exploration element, which would be the, the missions to Mars. It may sound like a distant destination beyond our reach, but that's what some called Apollo's goal to reach the moon. The image of Buzz on the moon represents our greatest achievement. It is both simple but beautiful at the same time. And that's why I think it resonated so well with everybody back on Earth. That photo looks more surreal to me now than it did even at the time. And it's just, it's an extraordinary statement about what we can do. We remember a time of passion for perfection, a level of achievement, which really surprised us all. Armstrong was really popular with the other astronauts who had great respect for him. I found his presence, I know, very, very kind of warm. There's something quite fatherly about him. And, and he, was, um, he was super bright. Thank you very much. I find Buzz Aldrin a really admirable character because he has had these struggles which he's had to deal with. And, but he's eccentric and he speaks his own kind of language. That often it's like he's orbiting around what he wants to say. I like to be associated with the fact that I was on the first lunar landing mission instead of being the second man to walk on the moon. But it doesn't bother me particularly. Uh, it irritates the heck out of my father though. Uh, he's always looking out for the best things for his offspring. One of the reasons why this photo resonates around the world is that it's not an overtly political image. What dominates the scene is the desolation of the moon and the two human beings who were there. It's really a photo about human endeavor. It's so inspiring for us uh, as a race to think, okay, you know, we can overcome these challenges. Nothing is impossible. Cooperation and teamwork is everything. And that's what I think Apollo 11 has given to us. It's inspiration. There was a message that came from New York and it said, we do not want anyone to take any unnecessary risk, but if someone could please photograph the occupied Tiananmen Square, we'd appreciate it. I started thinking, you know, I could get killed in this job. The students decided that the government would never listen, that we had no say. A truckload of soldiers shot guests in the front of the lobby. I'm focusing with the 400 millimeter, and some guy walks out in the middle of the street. He was so upset with what happened that he did not think of his personal safety. I took the one picture, advanced it, two, advanced it. They were willing to die for democracy and freedom. When I was a child, I was looking at a Time Life book and in that Time Life book, they had section with iconic photographs. And I remember seeing the Hindenburg crash and Nick Oot's famous picture of the Napalm Girl, Eddie Adams' picture of the uh, man who was getting shot. I remember these iconic photos, but as I was looking at them, I got the creepiest sensation that I was going to have a picture like this someday. I was born in 1966 in Beijing, in the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. And like many children, I spent about three, four years in, in labor camp. The Cultural Revolution in China was very much a scheme launched by China's leader at the time, Mao Zedong. It caused 40 million people in China starving to death. Mao did not feel that 
the old-fashioned traditional education was particularly important. That's why schools were closed, universities were all closed, and students, young people, really did not see much of a future. In 1976, Chairman Mao died, and the Cultural Revolution was over. We were able to study and to then go to university. By December 1978, Deng Xiaoping fully established his control over China and started the so-called reform and opening period. And he also appointed General Secretary Hu Yaobang, who in particular was prepared to explore all kinds of options for moving China forward. A hero to China's youth due to his progressive ideals, Hu Yaobang's untimely death in April 1989 was the cruelest of blows and was made worse by the government's decision to ban students from his funeral for fear of protests. When the funeral was taking place in the People's Hall, the students, three of them, knelt down holding the petition over their heads for hours. No one came. So the students decided that the government would never listen, that we had no say. So students started to march to Tiananmen. Those leaders who should have died are still in power. The leader who should have lived and lead us is dead. What kind of justice is that? What kind of country are we living in? We want change. As the protest gained momentum, news agencies around the world started to take notice of what was happening in Tiananmen Square. I finally got the word from New York that they wanted me to go to Beijing to help out on this story because there was thousands and thousands of people marching in the streets. By mid-May, there would be a million people in the square. And yet, the dialogue did not go anywhere. And so then the student leadership called for hunger strike. And a lot of them posted letters to their parents. Saying that they were willing to die for, for democracy and freedom. I arrived at the Associated Press office. I talked with the AP bureau chief, and uh, they told me what was going on at Tiananmen Square. It was a tense situation. Everybody was concerned. And I think everybody was trying to keep this powder keg under control. In all, there was a tug and pull situation. And that's what I was photographing. Gorbachev had been meeting with the Chinese leaders. I had a feeling that it was going to get big, and uh, so I was monitoring it. It was a deep embarrassment to the Chinese government that they had to allow Comrade Gorbachev to see the demonstrations showing that the Communist Party of China was no longer in control of the heart of Beijing. The press that came with Gorbachev started to report student democracy movement, the hunger strikers, and then the images of that were broadcast all around the world. Mark Avery, the photo editor in Beijing, he was an American. Uh, Lu Hanxing, he's a Chinese American based out in Delhi, and then there was me out of Bangkok, so it was the three of us only to cover one of the biggest stories of the 20th century. As the protests continued, the army began to gather. We saw platoons of soldiers appearing in the middle of city center. We were quite scared. But then, because we had huge numbers of us, so we were able to sort of expel them. On the evening of the 3rd of June, state-run media began to warn residents to stay indoors. The professors were saying, OK, this is it, it's coming. After a while, we decided someone was going to have to cover a night shift, and we drew straws. 
and I got the short straw, so I had to go. Everyone was given winter coat and, and told to carry a wet towel because we were convinced it will be rubber bullets and tear gas. As Diane slept on her university campus, the government ordered the military to clear the square by 6 a.m. on the 4th of June. Around midnight, I was woken up. People were knocking on our door saying, get up, get up, something's happening. Tanks were moving in. They had opened fire and people were, are dying. I was with Dan Beers, who was a, a AP correspondent. And suddenly we heard a vehicle coming and this vehicle's, you know, bam, bam, and people were just running in terror towards me around the corner, and all of a sudden I knew why they were running. There was an armored car with front machine guns, and it was going around the corner so fast that sparks were coming off the treads. Dan dropped the bike, he went one way, I went to the left side, dived in some ivy, so I pancaked it right there while this thing went by. So this mob then started chasing the armored car, and, and I got up, and then I start chasing. And finally, uh, they had cornered the vehicle in front of the lock gates at the Great Hall of the People. And I had one picture where they were all standing on top of it, you know, cheering, and they had big rocks and bricks in their hand. Once I had these pictures, I started thinking, I better make the deadlines in New York. And I started to head back. The students were trying to stop the tanks, and the tanks just didn't stop. They literally rode in. Then I noticed that there was something burning coming towards me in the street. It was a burning armored car. People were taking these steel barricades and poles and breaking them apart and putting them in the treads to stop this armored personnel carrier. I reached in my pocket to find a wide angle zoom. It wasn't there. I must have lost it when I jumped in the ivy. I walked right in front of that armored car, but the machine guns are right on me, and my flash, if I were to flash it, they might have thought it was a machine gun because several protesters had taken over military buses, and, and I had a picture of one of the protesters holding up an AK-47. A friend of mine, he said the students were not aware that those were live ammunition. I thought, I might be committing suicide taking this picture. Well, I made the photo, and I came around to the side, and there was a dead soldier on the ground. Then this leader says, you photo, you photo, you tell world. The problem was that I can only take one picture because of the flash. And he says, you take photo, more, more photo. And I couldn't explain to them that I can only take a picture every 60 seconds. So I said, I, I, I can't take any more pictures. And they started fighting again among themselves. Take a picture. No, waiting, waiting. We recycle. Come on. And I picked it up. And boom! Wow! I get hit in the face and everything. It was just like the cartoons with Bugs Bunny. You know, there's little stars going around. And, and I look down and there's a shattered lens and my flash is ripped off the top of the camera. One of those bricks those guys were holding had hit me square in the face. I look over and the back of that burning armor car opens up and one of the soldiers came out and I can still remember his pristine uniform. And he had his hands raised in the air to surrender. The mob looked at him. I'm trying to shake off, you know, the injury. And then they moved in on him with clubs and hatchets. And, and I looked at that, and I, I thought of two things. One, I'm going to lose the Pulitzer Prize because of this. Two, I should be ashamed for thinking about this because this guy's probably going to die. As photographer Jeff Widener battled to document what was happening in Tiananmen Square. I walked right in front of that armored car, but the machine guns are right on me, and my flash, if I were to flash it, they might have thought it was a machine gun. Diane Wei Liang waited for news from her fellow student protesters. Eventually, the students negotiated a withdrawal, and the square was cleared by 5 o'clock on June 4th. We waited and then some trucks bring in bodies. By morning, Jeff Widener had made it back to the AP office. There was a message that came from New York and it said, we do not want anyone to take any unnecessary risk. 
but if someone could please photograph the occupied Tiananmen Square, we'd appreciate it. And I just thought, oh no, now there's only three of us. So I just wasn't in any shape to go. And it was really scary because the, these soldiers were in trucks going all through the city, randomly shooting people. And Mark Avery said, somebody's got to go. And uh, I can't go because I'm the photo editor. And Lou says, oh, I can't go. I'm Chinese. They kill me. So uh, that's up to me again. And I, it looks like I got to go. Martial law was declared. The Beijing was taken over by the military. Streets were got, it was just soldiers everywhere. At crossings, we see military trucks. You could see the rifles pointing out. Got a bicycle and I started pedaling towards the Beijing Hotel, which is the closest vantage point to where the Tiananmen Square was. Over the horizon, slowly I could see a gun barrel and then a tank and then the treads and a guy with a, you know, with a massive machine gun. I rode the bicycle right underneath. Basically, I just looked like a scared tourist. Nobody could see I had any equipment or gear. My film was uh, shoved down into my underwear. There were soldiers standing guard at every crossing. They were holding the guns in the way, trigger ready. I finally got to the Beijing hotel. The problem was, Journalists that had been going to that hotel had been stopped by these uh, secret police. They were using cattle probes to shock the journalists if they didn't give up their notebooks or cameras. I see these secret police, a couple of guys coming towards me, and I thought, oh my God, they, they searched me, I'm, I'm dead. In the shadows, I see an American foreign exchange student. And I walked up to him and I said, hey, Joe, where you been? I've been looking for you. And I whispered, I'm from AP. Can you let me up to your room? And he says, yeah, come on. He, he, I mean, he just picked it up quickly. Kirk was the name of this uh, student. He took me to the elevator, and as we were going up, and he said, you know, you're really lucky you got here when you did, because just 10 minutes ago, a truckload of soldiers shot guests in the front of the lobby. The government announced the most wanted list of student leaders. Some were arrested at their hideouts somewhere in the country. The American student Kirk had volunteered to go out and find some film for Jeff's camera. He came back with one roll of film. So I put the roll of film in my camera, and I set the correct settings on it, and I took a nap. I was wakened by tanks coming down the street, the Chang'an Boulevard. And I'd gotten a lot of pictures of, you know, tanks pushing burnt buses out of the way. I went to the window, and this was different because there was a whole line of tanks. Then out of the left side, some guy walks out in the middle of the street with shopping bags. And I, and I thought to myself, this guy's gonna screw my picture up. You know, he's gonna, he's gonna get in the shot and mess my composition up. And then I thought, this guy's crazy. And so I'm, I'm focusing with the 400 millimeter and I'm thinking to myself, you know, this shot's too far away. And I'm looking back at the bed and I see another teleconverter that, well, it'll increase my focal length, it'll make it closer, but the risk is, if I go get it, he may disappear and be gone. But if I stay, it's so far away that it's not gonna be a good shot. So I've always been a gambler and I ran back to the bed. I got the teleconverter, put it on the camera, came back out. I took one picture, advanced it, two, advanced it. Then I looked at the meter in the camera and it was fluttering at 30th of a second. The shutter speed was too slow. And by the time I was horrified, what had happened? What went wrong? What, what, why is it so slow? The guy is swept away. And I came back in the room and I sat down in a chair next to the wall and I had my head down and I'm just going, oh man. And Kirk says, did you get it? Did you get the picture? And I said, you know, I don't know, man. I, I don't know, I don't think so. Kirk made um, an agreement with me and he was very brave. He put the film in his underwear and he was gonna smuggle it out past the guards. I was standing over the balcony just praying and not one of those rolls of film came out, out of his shorts and rolled on the ground. And um, little did they know that one of the most iconic photos, the most embarrassing photos of the Chinese government was just smuggled past them while they're in a smoke break. Jeff returned to the office, unsure of what had become of his photo. Lu Hanxing said, ah, oh, Jeff, you got some very bad messages from New York. And I said, God, now what's the problem? 
And I looked at uh, the telex sheet and it was messages from all over the world. AP said, uh, congratulations to Jeff Widener fronting all UK papers. Paris uh, office came in. Liberation wants an exclusive interview with Jeff Widener. All this was going on, these messages, and congratulations from bureaus around the world. I'm emotional about the whole thing because it's just had a profound effect on my life. In recent weeks, we've urged mutual restraint, nonviolence, and dialogue. Instead, there has been a violent and bloody attack on the demonstrators. The United States cannot condone the violent attacks and cannot ignore the consequences for our relationship with China. The Communist Party argues that the picture was evidence and confirmation that the army was incredibly careful and responsible because it did not crush that young person standing in front of it. It reduced the man to a tininess. That's what gave it the scale. The tank was huge, the square was huge. What was opposing was one man with only his courage to confront a tank. That's why it caught the imagination and summarized absolutely human spirit. This young man was willing to stand in front of the tanks. Maybe he had no idea what he could do, but he took the action. And we did the same thing. Tank Man was so upset with what happened that he did not think of his personal safety. He was going to make his case in front of these soldiers in the tanks. That was an exceptional act of either heroism or desperation that he didn't care any longer. A photograph is so instantaneous that it encapsulates so many emotions and thoughts I mean, it's an old cliche, but it really is the picture being worth more than a thousand words. You often got, can't get people to read a thousand words, but anyone can look at a picture instantly and get all sorts of emotions from it and thoughts. And I think that really is one of those cases. Up to today, if you go to China, you type in Tiananmen, it's either a complete blank or you get a piece saying Tiananmen was a myth created by the West. People talk about um what happened to Tank Man because he's disappeared. It's like he's the unknown soldier, you know? In some ways, maybe it's better that way because he's gonna be symbolic forever. We're all happy for the children of China growing up in a much more prosperous, freer society. On the other hand, we're sad that Tiananmen is being erased from history, from our own history. I was looking at America Online one day, and they had a headline, 10 Most Memorable Photos of All Time. And so I was looking at this, and there were the same photographs. There was the Hindenburg crash, and there was a picture of Buzz Aldrin on the moon. And then all of a sudden, this splash of color came up, and it was my Tank Man photo. That's when it finally hit me that I had done something rather extraordinary. I can't begin to explain how I felt when I saw that among all these iconic photos. And it was like, it happened exactly is I sensed it would happen back when I was a kid. I mean, it's just really very strange experience.